When my days are ending and my time has come. Hallelujah. I'm getting closer. I can see the lights of that great city. Isn't that awesome? When my days are ending. And every time I have the opportunity to stand up and speak, I just praise God for it. Somebody, my kids are joking and saying, hey, this is the last time I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak every opportunity I have a gift. So I don't know when the last time is going to be. But I just praise God for the glorious privilege to be here and thank God for Rabbi Greg and for the privilege of knowing him these past 14, 15 years that he's been here. I think I heard the third sermon he preached when he came here. And he preached and I sat and listened to him and he said words and preached words that I had written 10 years before. Like they jumped out of my skin. I've been jumping ever since. I know it makes some of y'all nervous, but y'all just have to excuse me. I, I'm going to make you nervous as long as I live, as long as God gives me breath. I'm going to bless the Lord, oh, my soul. All that is with me, bless his holy name. Let's look at that first slide, if you will, please. Tuesday was a week ago. I turned the radio on in my car. I keep it on that Christian station, and I heard the last phrase a man was saying. He said, I don't want to offend the Jewish people, but the church replaced the Jewish people. Boy, I just boiled up. I said, man, I want to offend all these ignorant people that don't read the Bible. They don't understand the teaching of the Word of God. And the Lord spoke to him and said, that wouldn't be nice. <laughs> and look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. Give no offense. Were the Jews to the Jews, as the Greek says, to the Greek people who are all the ungodly people or to God's messianic community, the fellowship of the body of Yeshua. We're not supposed to give offense. Some people think they can offend people into God or offend people into believing what we believe and worshiping on the Sabbath, but you can't. You know the only way you can change them is you've got to love them. You've got to be so full of God's love and so full of his blessings that they're going to say, where do you get all those? Why are you so happy? You say, it's because God's doing great work in my life. So we're not supposed to fear. And so think about it. If any person that ever lived in the body of Yeshua had the right or the privilege to offend anybody, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But look what he suffered to share this glorious gospel. We're going to be looking at that later. Let's look at the next slide, please. I've been praying. God gave me a vision about uh, two or three months ago. A revelation about the Word of God, one that was just astounding. I've been trying to tie together uh, biblically the word, the Hebrew word debar and the Greek word rhema and showing how all these writers from 1250 B.C. when God spoke those words to Moses down to 70 A.D. when the New Testament had been completed. And I couldn't find the exact word to do it, but I found it in the book of Hebrews Chapter 12, verse 19. We'll get there later. Don't turn to that. And I said, now, Lord, how can I tie these, all these things together? Uh, last week, one morning, about 3 or 4 o'clock, the Lord, Lord woke me up, and this verse just exploded in my heart. I said, thank you, God. Then what advantage are overflowing it uh, is it to be in a Jewish person? Or what it benefit or profit is it of circumcision? One great scholar that reads the Bible and prides himself on quoting every verse of Scripture left off that about circumcision. Circumcision was a sign that God gave Abraham to confirm the covenant. And it was a great benefit. Look what the next word says. Much in every way. Much in every way. This is the great Apostle Paul. Much in every way. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? You can't, I didn't say it. But Paul said it very clearly here in Romans chapter 3, verse 1. But then look what verse number 1 says. For first of all, and in the Greek when they use that word, is first and foremost and above all things. Woo! Above all things. God entrusted them with his living word. Woo! God in 
entrusted them with his living rhema. The word in the Greek there is logia, L-O-G-I-A. It means all the writings of the Old Testament. Mark in every way. I just cried in my heart. I don't remember what was the last Shabbat or Shabbat before the last one. Rabbi Greg stood up here and told y'all, he told y'all to go online and read that sermon and nobody in the congregation did it. Well, I don't have, I don't have uh, internet, so I, don't, I can't do that. So when he said that, I went off thinking about something else. But he was so disappointed. Why was he disappointed? Because we have this holy word and we live in a country where we can read it and study it. And nobody will condemn us or criticize us or kill us. And the devil keeps us from reading that holy word that God entrusted to the Jewish people. That set them apart from everybody else. Now one scholar said maybe that was uh, just the whole Old Testament. No, it's referring to the a it had to borrow him, the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses and cut the covenant with Israel. God entrusted them with his holy word. And God has made it available to us. And shame on most of us. We don't read it. And even, even a smaller percentage of us really study it. Ever since I realized this years ago, people say to me, well, preacher, if I had a college education, seminary education like you, I'd read the Bible. That ain't, that's not why you're not reading the Bible. The Bible wasn't written by college professors and seminary professors. Had nobody in the world could have understood it. It was written by the Ruach HaKodesh through farmers and preachers and everybody else. So therefore, anybody that wants to understand it, all they got to do is read it, and the Holy Ruach HaKodesh will just keep revealing it to you and keep revealing it. As long as you allow him to trust that word in your heart and your life. And that's what this thing says. First and foremost and above all things, they were entrusted with the logia, the barims of Adonayah. Look what it says. For, for if some did not believe it. Now some people think that means all or most. This man spoke on radio the other day. He's written 40 books. He's an outstanding author. I mean, well read. I'm not going to call his name because I wasn't sure I got the right name, but he's read, written over 40 books. And he said, all of Judaism has been replaced by Christianity, is what he called it. But I want to tell you something. God did not do away with Judaism. I met a Jewish man Tuesday night, Wednesday night, I believe it was, on the elevator. We was talking, he told me he was Jewish. I said, Shalom. He said, Shalom. He was surprised, I think, that I knew the word, the Hebrew word, Shalom. And then when we got off the elevator, I rode on up to where his floor was at. We got off, and he said, you know what? You Christians are just brothers of ours that grew up and exploded and expanded all over the world. He said, y'all grew up and came big. I said, yeah, that's right. But it does not say, it says, what if some, not most or all, did not trust Will their lack of faith nullify Adonai y'all's God's faithfulness? No. No. You can't nullify or change God's glorious revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. Now let's go to the next slide, please. Look what it says here in Acts 21, 20. They said, you brethren, he's talking to Paul, I think, and Silas at this point. How many thousand are there among the Jewish people who have believed? Dr. Carl Barth said a million and a half people from Benjamin and Judah was the early church. Let me tell you who the people were that didn't believe in Yeshua. They was the religious crowd. They were the religious leaders. They were the doctors of the law. And you know what? Religious people today don't trust God any more than they do did, did then. You get your little doctrines, you know, and you think everybody's yeah, got to believe like you believe. I just praise God for what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. It says, God has made us able ministers of the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant, 
not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter, but the Spirit, give life. He made him a minister of that. So he said, how many thousand there were among the Jewish people uh, who have believed? And look what the next phrase says, and they are all zealous for the Torah. What are you zealous for? What am I zealous for? Am I really zealous for God? Torah, that word Torah is, can be translated as that instruction, all God's instruction from Moses. And some of the writers believe that the Ten Commandments was the first thing that was written in the Hebrew faith and theology. And everything else is commentary. And anything that contradicts those four words that God gave, those ten words God gave Moses, is not God speaking. It's man's religious ideas of what God was saying. That's where a lot of people are today. What are you zealous for? You may not even realize what you're zealous for. I was a minister 21 years before I received the, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Y'all don't like the word baptism, but I don't know why you don't like it. These Baptists want to baptize everybody, but the devil don't care how many times you get baptized in the water. He just don't want you to get baptized in that Holy Ghost fire. Because if you ever get in there, brother, I'm going to tell you something. Your whole life changes. Everything it becomes new in God. It's unbelievable. I studied the Bible 21 years. And when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I thought I had a new Bible. When I opened it up, the fire was just running across the pages in it. And I read it day and night. And I read it. I read it, see the Holy Spirit on November 14th, 1970. And by March, I had read 40 books. I was reading like drove my precious darling wife crazy. She thought I was losing my mind. I did. I was losing the mind of old B.J. Abney, which was so evil and lust and sinful and trying to get the mind of Yeshua. And I'm still doing that. When you're zealous for something and you search for out, you ask the Holy Spirit to do that. Now I know they have a word in the literary world. No, he or ta, I think it is in the Greek. It means know yourself. Well, I went to seminary and I took pastoral counseling and I took uh, counseling and casework before I at Mercer. I thought I really know who I knew who I was, you know. Man, I, I, they wanted me to become a counselor, wanted me to go in graduate school and become a counselor. And I said, no, God's called me to preach. I think I better try to keep doing what he called me to do. The saddest thing on this earth is to meet a man or woman who God has called and anointed, and they don't follow through with it. They're like an empty shell walking around. It's horrible. And when I received the Holy Spirit they, back in 1970, that was the time they had a lot about of, of words of faith and words of knowledge. You know, if you was God's man, I suppose God's supposed to give me all the knowledge I need about knowing everything about you. But I didn't, I didn't find out that's how the Holy Spirit worked because he wasn't giving me all the knowledge I need to know about my wife or my children. He was giving me the knowledge I need to know about old BJ. Every time I examine my smell, if I come up smelling like a rose. When I allowed the Ruach HaKadosh to begin to examine me, I came up smelling like a cesspool. The Holy Spirit searches all things. The Greek says, even the pathos, P-A-T-H-O-S, deep things of God. If he knows all there is to know about God, there's a joke going around. Preachers tell about the uh, old drunk went home one night and his wife was a dedicated Christian. Woke her up and told her, I want you to pray for me. She got up on the side of the bed and said, Lord, save this old drunk. He said, don't tell him I'm drunk. I read the scripture this morning from Psalms. He already knows. He knows your thoughts before you even say them or think them. The holy Ruach HaKadosh searches all things, the deepest things of God. The word of Adonai Yah is able to judge the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. Now, brother, that's something beautiful. When you allow that Ruach HaKadosh and that the Bar Rama word begin to dwell in you, 
I'm telling you, he'll reveal more about yourself and about your past and your intents and desires than you've ever dreamed he would do. He will force you to come to know him and to know yourself as an unworthy, sinful creature who the Lord Jesus Christ, by his grace and mercy and through his shed blood, will forgive you of your sins and cleanse all your past from you. That's why you're not reading the Word of God, because the Ruach HaKadosh begins to search you. Every time you open that Bible, boy, he's got some nuggets laying in there for you, and you start reading it, and you'll find them. That Word will begin to get down inside of you, and we read in Psalm 139 earlier, that Word will get there, and he'll begin to plow up. The Bible, biblical word for it is fallow ground. That's shallow ground. That's where most of us are. We're shallow ground. We haven't allowed God to come and plow up that deepest personality inside of our souls and spirit. I was preaching up in Rome one time. An American of African descent laid his home down behind Myrtle Hill Cemetery. And I was talking about a three-story building. I said, we all meet each other here today. We got on our nice clothes, not perfume and all that. But our family lives with us in the living room, in the, in the dining room. But there's a basement down here that nobody knows but us. And I was up there trying to illustrate about that. And I reached over and called a hold of the closet door handle and they jumped up don't open that door don't open that door that's the way we are with God we don't want him to open that door and go down inside where our thoughts and intents and desires are all there wound up like a ball all he wants you to do is just invite him in when you do he steps in on the first step and says thank you for trusting me and inviting me into the citadel of your soul Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. And he comes in. And he begins to wash the basement. He blood washes it. And he cleanses all those past little sins you worry about. And then that old flesh that you drag around with you, as big as this pulpit here or beamer here. And as long as you allow him to take hold of it and hold on to it, he will give you victory over your flesh. If you through the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh and the desires of the heart, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh does that. He searches that deepest part and recesses of our soul. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now we're going back to Jeremiah chapter 15. Look what their first three words are. Say them together with me. Y'all sure did say it kind of quiet like. <laughs> Let's say it again. Adonai, you know. Woo! You don't have to inform him. He knows. According to Psalms 139. Even before you were formed, he formed you and knitted you together in your mother's womb. And I just praise God for my mother and my father. I was born July 10, 1929, right in the middle of the Depression. I was a seventh child. But thank God my mother and father both had been raised on a farm. They knew how to live off the ground and off the soil. Now they even have courses in college to teach you how to live off the soil. I learned that from the time I was a small child. I watched that man and that woman when the Depression was at its greatest in 33 and 34. Dig a living for us out of the soil in North Georgia. He weaved me together, wove me together in my mother's womb. One Saturday afternoon, it was a cold, rainy day out where it was spring or fall. He bought $2 worth of steak, and I tell you, it looked like about 10 pounds. I never saw such a pile of meat in my life. Told him, my mother said, Mama, you and the boy, you and Mildred did cook the supper. Why me and the boy go do the chores? And I, we lived in a four-room house that was down the four rooms at the wreck like this. And behind it, Mama had her chickens out there. And my job was to water the chickens and feed them, you know. And I went out, and the kitchen was right at the end of that. I smelled that steak cooking. <laughs> that was 83 years ago, and I can still smell it today. <laughs> but what was so great is when we got to the table, I, I sat on a bench right next to my father he prayed and his prayer was very short always the same prayer had my father make the same for these blessings all other blessings life for christ's sake amen and we sat quietly and he said children eat 
my mother cooked 48 biscuits and made gravy. And I'm going to tell you, in 30 minutes, there wasn't a shred of biscuit or gravy or nothing else on that table. Brother, we ate. But while we were eating, I noticed my dad, he, when he started eating, he started, people call it perspiring, he'd sweat. And I noticed big old tears were just rolling down his cheeks. I looked at him. I said, my goodness, he's crying. Somebody said, why was he crying? Because he had enough food to feed his children. He was so thankful and grateful. You see, God weaves us together. God knows. Now look what Jeremiah says. Remember me and think of me. Avenge me of my persecutor. Because of your long suffering, do not take me away. That mark of through me uh, in the Greek is a word long suffering. I've only read one theologian in all the I've read that ever discussed that word. Dr. Emo Bruner in his Christian Doctrine of God said, by the way, he was about three fourths of one page is all he discussed it. But we ought to be writing books and books and books upon it because if it was not for God's long suffering, guess what? None of us would be here today. And Paul was saying this writing to the Gentiles, telling them that God was long-suffering with the Jews, even though some of them did not realize that Yeshua was the Messiah. But God was going to bring his uh, correction, we call it uh, in our word, but the word in Greek was wrath, upon them. But his wrath is reforming. God was going to bring them to him through the things he allowed them to suffer. And that's the way he does in our lives. That word... Marco Thumia is a Greek word, means long suffering. Now, I want to illustrate that in Romans chapter 9, verse 22. Now, what if God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath who prepare themselves for destruction? That last phrase, who prepare themselves for destruction. It's one of the most amazing in the Bible. Some Bibles read who designed themselves for destruction. And Luther and Augustine and Calvin took that word and said, you know what? I have a dear friend here in Maker, and he believed with all of his heart that God don't love everybody. I said, man, how can you believe that when the Bible says, John 3, 16, for God what? I heard that argument when I was six years old. We went to a primitive Baptist church one Sunday for homecoming. My dad was thinking about joining the church. My mother was Presbyterian. And the guy got up there and preached an hour and a half and started quoting John 3, 16, got about halfway through it and said, oh, you know how the rest of that verse goes. Well, when we started home, mom and daddy was discussing it. My dad said that verse contradicted everything that man said. They took that word there and translated it as though God designed some people to go to hell and some people to go to heaven and what anything you could do about it. That's Western heathen theology. <laughs> you go back and read in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. I can't give you the exact verse, but just read the whole chapter. It won't hurt you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I hadn't thought about that one before. And he said, I have set before you the way of life and the way of death. What did he say do? Choose. Choose life. Choose life. And it says very clearly in, in the uh, second uh, first, first Timothy and also in Peter's epistle that God does not want anybody to be lost, but he wants everybody to be saved. So they're not even reading the New Testament, let alone reading the Old Testament. But in the Greek, that word says, who prepared themselves for the destruction, Dr. Dale Moody said that word is in the middle voice. It's something they do themselves. Oh, I love to use this illustration. Did you know what? God put a barricade over hell. His son. He barricaded hell with his son. And everybody that goes to hell has to crawl over every prayer, everything God's ever done, and plunge into hell in spite of all that God could do to save them. 
Everybody knows that. It's something they do to themselves. It's a middle voice in the Greek. And that, that subjunctive in the Greek is something that we have to do ourselves. We'll get to that a little later. So here it says in this passage, uh, now if God willing to discriminate his, demonstrate his wrath to make his power known and endured with long suffering vessels of wrath who prepared themselves for destruction. Or who, uh, great word, sometimes that's something they did to themselves. Now let's go to the next phrase, please. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Bear in mind. Most of us don't have the mind of Christ. Did you know the Bible says we have the mind of Christ? If you've got the mind of Christ, you've got to bear in mind that the long suffering of God is for what? Salvation. Look at it. Long suffering of God. With you and with me. I didn't become a Christian until I was 20 years old. My mama thought when I called him, I was called to preach. She liked to have a heart attack. She thought if any of the other boys would be a preacher besides me, she said I was a hard hearted son she had. I said, Yeah, mama, but God's word and that Ruach Hakadesh crushed that old hard heart. And the day I was saved in the noon service, that night at about 10 o'clock, I went to her house and I prayed in her family altar. Well, she'd been asking me for two and a half years to pray, and I didn't know how to pray. I said, Mama, I want to pray. And I don't remember what I said. I maybe just cried. I don't, I don't remember. But it was such a blessing to do that. Bear in mind that our Lord's long-suffering means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul, who also wrote with the wisdom that was given to him, he writes the same thing in all his what? Listen, we've got a letter here in the New Testament confirming the letters that Paul wrote to the church. Get it? Silas wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and Silas was Paul's traveling companion from the second missionary journey the rest of his life, and he wrote this second epistle, and he said he had read Paul's letters, he had read Romans, how profitable it was to be a Jew, and how profitable it was to have that in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. Now, here's where everybody goes astray. They say, well, Saul, Paul's letters are hard to understand. No, they're not. You've got to read them. You've got to study them. You don't understand them because you don't read them. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. These matters is not that Paul's letters are hard to understand. It's that God is so long-suffering. I can't believe some of y'all are jumping up and down and dancing, praising the Lord. <laughs> God is so long-suffering. See, here we have in Romans 9, 22, we have back in Jeremiah chapter 15 about the long-suffering of God. That's where Paul got his understanding of the long-suffering of God. And that Jeremiah wrote that in 650 B.C. And God gave those commandments and words to Moses back in 1250 B.C. as best they can understand. So here they find that word that was moving down. His letters contain some things. His long suffering that are hard to be understood. Read that next phrase with me. What is it? Ignorant and what? Unstable people do what? Distort. If you listen to Rabbi, thank God for Rabbi Greg Hussberg, he'll tell you about much of the distortion that's taking place today of the television and these evangelists and all these people bragging for money and preaching all this prosperity gospel and all that crap that's on television. They're distorting the Word of God. Amen. They're not preaching the teaching the true Word of God. Amen. All kinds of distortion. I heard one man say right after I received the Holy Spirit, he loved the Baptist people. And he, I said, why? He was raised Methodist. He said, because your church taught you the Bible. I said, you can't tell these Baptist people just anything. And he was right, because I tried to tell them about the Holy Spirit, and they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> they kicked me out the front door, and I'd go in the back door. <laughs> I felt like God called me to be a missionary to Southern Baptist. I really love them. 
They do most of what many men of us don't do. They have a zeal for winning souls for Christ. Shame on us for not doing that. Y'all going to amen me? I'm going to amen myself. Amen! Because <laughs> the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, we are indebtors to everybody that does not know Jesus Christ. It says in Romans 8, 13, we are not debtors to the flesh, but we're indebtors to the real cost of death. And the reason most of us aren't witnessing and telling people about God because we haven't allowed that Ruach HaKadosh to come in our life and do his continuous sanctifying work in our life and revealing to us how God-suffering God really is. And they distort the word of God, as do many others, the scriptures, to their what? Own destruction. See, we got it back here on that last slide we had up there about uh, in that uh, middle voice. It says they fitted themselves for destruction. They turned away from God. <laughs> now, if you don't believe that, go to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It said, and they knew God, and they decided God was not worthy of their life, and they turned against God. And God said, okay, if you're going to turn against me, I'll just turn, I'll turn you on. And let you paddle your little boat down the road by yourself. Somebody said, oh, I don't like that. Well, God wouldn't do that, would he? He certainly would and does every day. So here we find this long suffering, not only in Jeremiah chapter 15, find it in Romans chapter 9, 22. Here we find it in 2 Peter 3, 51. Let's look at the next slide, please. Your words were found. <laughs> I first started back to school. They told me in 1954, said, Mr. Abner, my son's sixth grade's got more education than you have. But I've been pastoring a church since 1951. I got up one Sunday, and I, I had a young lady going to Berry College in Rome. She was sitting over here on the right. I said to myself, I wonder how I sound that young lady. I listened to myself talking. It was horrifying. <laughs> we didn't speak English. We spoke English. <laughs> As a lower-educated person here in Macon, Bibb County, they speak it today, and I can understand everything they say. So your words were found, and I ate them. Taste and see how lo good the Lord is. You can taste the word of God. In fact, the business it says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5, taste the good word of God. And made partakers of the Holy Ghost, Ruach HaKadosh. You can taste and see how real and wonderful God is. Deuteronomy 8, 3, which is a very famous passage. In order to make you understand that men does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. I had a young lady up in Rome. I saw her the first day she went to school. Her brother was a good friend of mine. And I think he, I, we were in the third grade, I believe it was, and she was in the first grade. And she got out there, she's standing by J.W. Pinson, and I saw her, and she had beautiful blue eyes and long, curly hair. They rolled it around this way, you know, all the way down. I looked there, and I said, oh, she's a beautiful child. She called me back in 1977. She said, Billy John, my husband is sick, and I got a young son. He's dying with leukemia. You may not know who I am. I said, oh, yeah, I know who you are. I, knew, I saw you the first day you got on the school bus to go to school. I went out and prayed with her husband, and God healed him. And her son had leukemia, and his tongue was broke out. had big sores on his tongue. He died just about two months later. I was there when he was dying, and his mother went to cry, and he stopped. He said, Mama, don't do that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. We've allowed the world to scare us to death about death. I'm going to tell you something. Death is not a defeat for a believer. It's a graduation, an elevation. I went to the hospital. I went to the doctor last Monday and had a checkup, and he did blood work on all my bloods. The kids have been worried about me not doing well. So I thought I'd play a little trick on them. I met with them last night. I said, I got my doctor report about it, and it's a bad report. One of my sons said, you going to die? I said, no, 
and I handed it to him, and everything in there, I was in the middle. I, didn't, I wasn't over any, on anything on that whole report. I said, now, see, that's a good report to y'all, but that's a bad report to me because I desire to go and be with the Lord, which is far better. Rabbi Greg says it almost every other Shabbat. I'm desiring to go home and be with the Lord. I want the Lord to come back. Well, see, I'm about, I'm about uh, 25, 27, maybe 30 years down the road beyond, beyond him. You see, thy word is my delight. Thy word is my delight. You know what? You spend time with everything you delight and love. That's the reason we don't read and study the word of God. We don't delight in it like we should. We don't hunger and thirst after it like we should. Because he said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. Well, why are so many of us so empty? <laughs> because you haven't been reading and studying the word of God. That's why. See, the devil, he's trying everything he can, do everything he can to keep you out of this word of God. It says here and there, you, you, but your words are, are were a delight to me, and I put that word are in there to me. And the joy of my heart when I call upon your name, when I'm called by your name. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, of whom my name is called. If you call yourself a believer or a Christian, then brothers and sisters, God's word should be your joy and your delight. People shouldn't have to beg you. Rabbi Gray shouldn't have to sit up here and beg y'all to read and study the Word of God. You, you, when, you, when it becomes your joy and your delight, you'll fuss when you don't have time to read it. <laughs> when things interfere with your schedule of reading the Word of God and studying in your prayer time and your time to read the Word of God, you'll, you'll regret it. You'll go ahead and do those things, but you'll say in all time in your heart, boy, I wish I had time to get in that Word this morning. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. We're going back to Jeremiah, chapter 15, but we're going to 15, 16, we're going to 17. If you will, what? Return. That word in the, in the Hebrew and the Greek both means if you will turn around, to repent don't mean to feel sorry for yourself or sorry you got caught because of your sin. It means that you're sorry that you've ever sinned and you're going this direction, but you turn around and go this direction. Toward God. And if you do that, I will what? I will restore you. And what? You will stand before me. You know what that illusion is? When God created Adam and Eve and put them in the Garden of Eden, every day at the cool of the day, he went down in the garden and fellowshiped with them. But when Eve ate the apple and then Adam ate it, they heard God's voice coming into the garden. What did they do? They run and hid. They couldn't stand in the holy presence of God. When the word of God becomes your joy and your delight, and you allow the rock Hakadesh to teach you and preach you the word of God, I'm telling you, it allows you to stand in the holy presence of God. When you have those holy moments, I'm going to tell you there's nothing in this world that will compare to that. You can't buy that. You can't inherit that. You just have to allow God to teach you and the Ruach HaKadosh to empower you and let you to study the Word. And when you get in there, you'll find out He's moving those things out of your life that's hindering you from coming and standing in His holy presence. Where can I go and hide from his rock? David said in Psalm 49. And where can I go from his presence? Where can I go? Nowhere that you can ever go in this universe and escape God's rock, Hakadesh, and his divine holy word. If you go to hell, you're going to remember every sermon you've ever preached all your life. Oh, and that's going to be a hell for some people. You're going to remember every time God spoke to you and you turned a deaf ear to his voice. 
you're going to remember and say to yourself how stupid I was to allow that little sin of that little thing in my life to keep me from receiving this holy God and having fellowship with him. God not only wants to save you from hell, he wants you to become his temple so he can come down and live in you down here on the earth. Paul said, we're made to sit together in the heavenlies with, with sure Messiah. Most of us sitting on the edge of hell instead of sitting together in heaven. You say, oh, you don't know all the problems I've got in my life. Oh, you mean that's what's keeping you from sitting in the heavenly places? Well, I've had a few problems myself. My son was killed when he was 32 years old. His wife shot him. They'd been on drugs. My daughter died when she was 38 with cancer. My wife died in 98 on our 49th anniversary. She married again, and uh, that wife died in 204. Somebody said they were going to point a sign for me and put it on me and say, Women, beware. <laughs> I had a son that died with ALS in 2006. It's not the circumstances and situations in your life that's keeping you from God and sitting together in heavenly places. It's the fact that you aren't spending time in this holy writ and you aren't allowing the Ruach HaKadosh to make this living word come alive in your heart and soul. Amen. 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 You're welcome. Amen. Let's go to the next slide, please. Hold it just a minute. Hold it just a minute. Go back up, please. I will, if you return, I will restore you and you will stand before me. If you extract the what? The precious from the what? Worthless. You say, well, I just don't have time. Well, you're doing a lot of stupid dumb things you don't even be, you need to be doing. Boy, I'm going to tell you, if you invite the rock hockey to come in your life never more before you get out of bed, say, Lord, I've got a few things to do today. How should I do them? He just tell you how to do them just like that. And you dig up and get those things done. Still have time to spend with God's Word. The Holy Spirit will have, outline every day of your life. And you'll get twice as much done allowing Him to guide your life as you can do yourself. But you've got to extract the worthless from the precious. That's why the devil keeps you out of the Bible. Because every time you start reading, you won't be reading long until you'll find something worthless in your life. If you'll extract that, he'll put something glorious in the place of that. <laughs> so, brother, it'll, it'll be a time where you just distract as much as you can because you get more of his glory in your life, more of his glory in your life. So there it is. Now, here, here's a sermon that God gave me about three months ago. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 19, I mentioned it a while ago. LXX, that's a word, the symbol for the Septuagint was translated in 2000 B.C. by 70 Jewish rabbis. And in their translation of Deuteronomy 4.12, it says, Elamas curia pro homiora ek miso to pura homni rata. I'll give you the translation of it. Look what it says. Adonijah spoke to Moses out of the midst of the fire. Everybody was reading my word. Woo! When you get in this word and start studying it, the Ruach HaKadosh will begin to speak out of that fire of that Ruach HaKadosh, those living words in your life and your soul. You won't be able to turn a deaf ear. You won't want to turn a deaf ear. That's what those ten words that God spoke to Moses that back in uh, the, the, in the Exodus chapter 20. It was those living words out of the midst of the fire, God spoke them to him. And that's what he began to cry out. And you know what it says in one of the places? And when God did that to him, he said, I was fearful and trembling. That's what the living word of the living God through the power of the real Chakadesh does in your life. You'll fear and tremble because of all the sins that or in your life. And all the little things that you don't think is bad or wrong, the real Hakadesh will make them seem like they're exceedingly wrong. In fact, in Romans it says, uh, it says if they're, when sin becomes exceedingly sinful, did you know you sin yourself away from God? There's a Hebrew word over there, because I tried to find it, I couldn't find it. I will, though. It's H-E-N-N-E, henny. And it means to unsin yourself. That's what extraction is. 
You got a beautiful illustration of it in the Old Testament. The high priest, when he went into the Holy of Holies once a year, what did he do? He spent three or four days unsinning himself. How much time did you spend this last week unsinning yourself? You sin yourself out from under God's protection and love. And when you unsin yourself, you go back in under. See? I will, if you return, I will restore you and you will stand in my presence. That voice, that word, Adam, I spoke to Moses out of the midst of the fire. The words, the voice of the word. That's what that word, when I saw that voice of the word in Greek, I knew that's exactly what they were talking about. Now, see what this does? It ties Hebrews all the way back with Moses in 1250 B.C. The same word runs all the way through the Bible from one end to the other. And the Bible tells us very clearly in Romans 7, the law is spiritual and holy, and the law is spiritual. How could a learned scholar, the man, stand up and say God rejected the Jews and the church replaced the Jewish people? Heresy, that's what it is, heresy. Let's go to the next slide, please. Acts 7, 38. If you don't believe what it says, go read that part verse of Scripture. It says, he that was with him in the church in the desert. Some people say the church was born on, on a Pentecost Sunday. No, the church had been there when God brought them up out of the land of Egypt. The church was there in the desert with Moses. That's what it said in Acts 7, 38. And Moses received the living words of the living God. And I know y'all spoke them to him as a fire. That's why you can never escape God's presence and never escape God's Ruach HaKadosh. I have a friend last Christmas Eve, his neighbor, got in his truck, got him a big bottle of wine, turned his radio up as loud as it would go, and got drunk. And got his truck stuck in the neighborhood on the right side of his house. And the later neighbor called the law to him. When this friend of mine told me that, I wanted to say, I wondered what he was trying to drown with that wine. And stop that voice of God. You know what? You can drown it with drugs. And you can drown it with alcohol and everything else. But when you wake up, it's still there. You can never stop it. You can never escape it. It's God's living word speaking to your heart and your life. Thank God we can't escape it. Of course, we all could we'd all be in hell because it's time we'd all run away from it. He spoke to him. So what is God speaking to you today? People say, well, I just didn't know any better, preacher. That's what the Bible calls a lie. Said, he said, you knew God. You knew what was right and wrong. All these people say they don't believe in God. They get mad and say, you hurt my feelings. You didn't treat me right. By, by whose standard? If there's no absolute rights and wrongs, then we, you know, you talk, why are you so confused about people hurting you? They can't. But there is an absolute right and wrong. It's those ten living words that God spoke to Moses. And some people say, I haven't heard. Well, Paul s- solved that problem in Romans 10 when he said, verse 18, But I say, they have not heard, have they? And then he repeated after the question, Indeed they have. Indeed you have. You may not have listened, but you've heard. That is a quote from Psalms 19, 4. The voice has gone out into all the earth and the word of the Lord to the end of the world. Let's look to the next slide, please. Conclusion. Thank you, Lord. I thought it disappeared. <laughs> I got a printout over there. <laughs> Woo! Ain't God wonderful? Woo! Praise you, Lord. <laughs> I, David, look at that printout right there. I've got a printout there. It don't have, it's right there in that seat. They don't have the conclusion. So I had to go through the Bible and find what the conclusion was. <laughs> See how the devil works? He tries to block out everything. See, David don't have the conclusion on that. And I looked and I wanted to see this. I don't know where you know it or not. I remember the first radio I ever heard. It was in 1938. My uncle and my uncle, uncle Lester and that Eunice Godfrey bought a 36 Ford. One of the most beautiful things I ever saw. All cars in was black. They didn't have any different colors. And and this thing was blue. It had a light blue. And it had a radio right in the middle of the dash. It had a circular round clock-like dial on it. 
And when you listen to the radio back then, it was coming in a radio wave and you could hear it loud and clear. But if another wave came and it was stronger than it was, it knocked it off and you had to retune the radio. You had to fine tune the radio. You get it? That's what's wrong with most of us. We aren't fine tuning our receptor. The voice of God is just as strong and real today as it was the day it spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. It's not the proclaimer and the broadcaster, it's the receiver that's out of tune. It's the receiver that's out of tune. I want to read you one verse here out of this. It's take me just a minute. I want you, I want you to listen to what Paul was telling, going back in this of 2 Corinthians verse 6. Uh, chapter 6, it was talking about what God would do and what they would do. If I can find my glasses here somewhere. I'm just about to get through. Y'all hold on, as Rabbi said. I'll get, we'll be through in just a minute. Listen to what it says. For we are the temple of the living God. I went to, I went to High Point, and a young man got up there, and he was lecturing about the temple. You know, and he said, you know what? I'm jealous. I said, Why? He said, because I would like to have been there and seen the glory of God. I raised my hand. I said, young man, don't you know we are God's temple? And if you're fine-tuning yourself through studying the Word and listening to the Royal Cockadef, I'm going to tell you God will physically and literally come down and live inside you. Listen to what it says in the verse just below that. Touch no unclean things, therefore. Then I will take you in. God will take you into his holiness and his love and his power. God will take you in. If you're outside this morning, it's because there's some of those uncommon things, those things that aren't clean that's in your life. You've got, you got to extract those things that are worthless and hang on to those things that are precious. Are you retaining your, are you fine-tuning your receiver? 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have all these promises, loved ones, let us what? Cleanse ourselves from all defilement of body and spirit. And that word cleanse in the Greek is the word polluted. Did you know Khrushchev came to America back in the 60s from Russia? He stayed in Washington several days. He got on the train road all the way across America, went to California, went to Los Angeles. When he started to get on the boat of the plane, leave out there, you know what he said? We don't have to worry about destroying America. They're destroying themselves. The most polluted mind in the world today is in America. The greatest mission field in the world today is America. We're polluted. Our minds are polluted. Our thoughts are polluted. And we're not doing what he says here. See, you cleanse yourself from our all defilement of the body and the spirit, perfecting holiness in fear. That word is all that Rabbi is always talking about. All of the Ruach HaKadosh. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, The God of peace himself. Every time we have our liturgy in the morning, come down and say, Yahweh sanctifies us. I always say, Hallelujah! The God of peace himself will sanctify you. Holy litas. That word in the Greek is holy telos. And the word that's got T-E-L-I-S, it's an adverb. And it's plural. What does an adverb modify? A noun. An adverb can modify an adverb, an adjective, or anything. But an adverb modifies an noun. He will sanctify you himself, holy telios, in your spirit, your soul, and your body. And he will preserve you, holy of Sirah, Sirah. Every part. He won't just take 90% and leave you 
I got something to tell you. He won't take 99% and just leave you 1%. You've got to be zealous. It's got to become your desire and your zeal to know God or to die in the process of trying to find him. When I received the Holy Spirit in 1970, my daughter Ruth's here today. I went to the church study in the prayer room, and I was praying. I said, Lord, if you don't help me, I'm going to die. He said, Billy Abner, that's what I've been waiting on, you to die. <laughs> what did Paul say about dying? He said, I, what? Die daily. You got to die to this old world. You got to, through the rock like death, put the deeds, the deeds of the body and the thoughts and the intents of the desire. Well, I'm telling you the truth. God came into my life, and it was most, one of the most glorious blessings I ever had in my life. Forty-seven years ago. I walked down to the house where my oldest son was in Vietnam, part of that situation, got on drugs, cost him his life. So you young people, don't ever take that first dose of drugs. Don't ever smoke that first joint of marijuana. It's dangerous. It's deadly. It'll destroy your life. And I got through and I went down to the house and I walked through, had a double car garage and had one door here went into a little room with bedroom here you went in the family room Bruce was laying on the couch watching cartoons on Saturday morning I walked in the door and she blurred her eyes that big around and said daddy what's happened to you said you get a raise she must have thought one time preachers had happened when they got a raise I said no honey I got an elevation he will sanctify you whole teleos in your spirit and your soul and your body and he will preserve Holy Seros, every part of your life, if you would just allow him to come in. The secret is, is taking that word of God and letting it become the delight and joy of your soul. And then inviting that Ruach HaKodesh to minister that word to you and put to death those things in your life that are unpleasing to God. Oh, I tell you, it's a goal worth setting for yourself. It's something that's worth everything you have to give to you to see it. And if you ever do, you will never, ever, ever be the same again. Let us stand together. Brother Dave, you're going to say the prayer for us? I want to say the New Testament prayer that I learned. I've, I've tried to learn this ironic prayer. When you get old, you know, you learn things, and the first thing you know, it's done gone somewhere else. And, but I learned this one long ago, and it's from the New Testament. It's from Paul. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Ruach HaKodesh be with you as you go and depart. Brother Dave, if you'll come and say our benediction, please. Let us join together in prayer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon yes, you. Yes, Lord. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, the Sar Shalom, Yeshua HaMashiach. Yivareke Karanai Veishmareka Ya er Adonai Poner Valeka Vehuneka Isa Adonai Poner Valeka Via Semleka Shalom Shabbat Shalom God bless you and keep you in our prayer Love you man You always bring your word Thank you, thank you That's what it says over in 1 Peter 4, 10, and 11 says.